back to Enjoy Parenting. I'm back with Kyle Steele, my co-host, and Mark Pellegrino. Um, we spoke a few weeks ago on the uh, challenges and successes of step parenting, and I wanted to follow up on that conversation, but there was a big pause um, between conversations because uh, Mr. Steele and I found ourselves at school trying to manage the combination of Omicron and absolutely unmanageable COVID school policies. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's what we've been spending several weeks doing. Yeah, it, it did feel like a scene out of Atlas Shrugged for a while, but we got to the other side of it and uh, um, everything's hunky-dory at the school now. So really glad to be back. Yeah. Um, so uh, Kyle and I were reflecting that the title of the show is Enjoy Parenting, but our conversation, Mark, had a lot more to do with what is very often not enjoyable about parenting. That is just a reality of parenting that there is a lot of, can be a lot of struggle and pain and strife and conflict and all sorts of things in parenting. And we don't want to pretend that those things don't exist. Um, and we also do want to figure out principles for best managing those really difficult and complex and painful situations and try to draw out what lessons we can, because no matter what cards were dealt, we want to, we always want to focus on trying to figure out how to do the right thing ourselves and at least have the confidence that we're uh, doing the best parenting job we can, um, recognizing what is out of our control and acknowledging the things that are that are difficult and figuring out how to manage those with the goal of making parenting the best, most enjoyable experience it can be. Um, so what, what we thought we'd do is kind of go back to some of the things that we talked about last time and try to get a better understanding of what some of those struggles were and give some thought to what internally we have to tell ourselves in those situations and how to manage them individually, not, not uh, practically in terms of relations with the child or with um, step parents or that sort of thing, but just internally, and then also how to do, do the best we can as step parents under those circumstances. Um, so I wanted to ask you, and I can bring some things up that we talked about last time, what would you say was the greatest struggle or what were some of the most difficult struggles of step parenting for you? I think the most difficult issue is having other parents who are oppositional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I assumed that that was what you would say and, and reflecting on my own experiences, that's what I would say was the most difficult for us is because I know you sort of described it as separate and contradictory worlds where there was no um, mutual understanding, no teamwork, no effort to provide continuity from one household to the next. And that I was thinking about it earlier and thinking it feels almost like a hostage situation where you've got this this child who's such a value to you and, and their well being is so much out of your control um, when they're at the other household. So, uh, Kyle, I don't know if you have any thoughts you want to share just about that struggle. I, um, I, I remember being in the thick of it myself and being told to, you have to remember to keep your own side of the street clean. And that was a phrase that stuck with me a lot because it was both, I mean, it was obviously a reminder not to engage in hostility, not to make this situation more combative, not to exacerbate things. It was a positive prescription about how to try to interact with my ex, but it was also a, a prescription of serenity where it's like you are confined to your own side of the street and all you can do is keep that in the best order that you can. And then- yeah have serenity when they have to cross the street into a world over which you have no control. The thing that makes me think of, and it's going to sound a little silly, is school uniforms. Mm -hmm. um, the best argument I've ever heard for school uniforms has been uh, for those, those miraculous charter schools um, in, in uh, disadvantaged inner city uh, communities. 
and that they they really strongly believe in school uniforms because it's a really clear visible signal to the child that this world is different than your home world and it uh has uh, a different set of structures and boundaries and so forth um and that 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 tangible reminder is helpful for them in not just managing behavior in a, in a crude way but just um signaling that this is a different culture um maybe a a culture that you'll feel more safe in and so the 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 struggle of those charter school teachers in the inner city reminds me a little bit of this situation that you i'm a teacher uh trying to run a, a safe and loving classroom and I have zero control over what happens outside of school. And they could have just terrible environments that they're coming from mm -hmm. and having to accept what is my, my locus of control and to build a really strong culture. Um, and is the, that seems to be the best advice that one can have. But the thing is that it's really, it's really hard advice to take because it's not just a student relationship. It's a child that you care about, and you 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 you're sending. It's it could be your own flesh and blood, or or as close to it as possible, and you're sending them into an environment that you really uh, despise and hate for a lot of reasons. But as much as we hate it, we have to kind of say, I'm going to have as strong of a culture within my four walls as I can to help. And not just the culture, like I'm going to teach you some good lessons, but also lots of values, lots of love, lots of things that you build with that person. So I don't know how well that hits because I, I'm the one person here that has not been a step parent or a step child, but that's the first thing I think of. But at some point, one, at some point, at some point, the out group has to discipline. Mm -hmm. And if, if the the in group of the the other parents say has mm -hmm. has claimed that there's a choice you can make between parents, yeah, that sort of fundamental, um, mm -hmm. it makes disciplining for the out group very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Even, even keeping your house clean, which may include disciplining your child, becomes yeah. next to impossible because the child can then say, "I choose over here because I don't have any." issues to, to to contend with over there no how do you do yeah. that yeah there's no extradition laws um between the two households um uh, i it's a, a remarkable situation and and i have to confess some ignorance about the i know there's a whole realm of divorce law that that governs a lot of these things is would it be po possible for you to share a little bit about that like was there any sort of a a, a uh, did a, a, a judge decide that the child can go either way or was it um, a, a private uh, agreement between the parties? There was ju there. The judge just uh, split custody between the father and the mother and the father. Uh, when the mother approached the father about having the same rules, uh, the father, who's a psychiatrist, said, no, I don't want to do that. And I think the children should be able to choose who they want to be with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and when confronted that that's not a very good idea, that that could incentivize all kinds of bad mm -hmm. behaviors on the part of the children using uh, the parents off of each other and the parents competing in ways that aren't healthy for the child, he still refused to do that, mm -hmm. to, to, to bend. Yeah. So Kyle, I can think of two um, scenarios here. I'm not sure which it sounds like, Mark, in your case, it wasn't a judge's decision. My understanding is that over about the age of 12, um, courts will grant voice to the child to, um, mm -hmm. to legally decide which household they want to be part of. But I think a lot, uh, this is the hostage situation again. I think a lot of people end up faced with the problem that in order to contest um, if it's a if it's a private decision made, you know, the father tells the child, you can choose to live with me or your mother. Um, in order to contest it, you have to go through the courts. My experience with the courts was that they're absolutely uninterested in your case unless it is falls on the most extreme margins of human depravity. I mean, that's that's what they're accustomed to dealing with. If you seem like reasonably intelligent professional people, they're just not interested in, in intervening. Um, and then I'm sure if you're dealing with a situation of hostility, you always run the risk of exacerbating hostility if you contest what 
what the uh, other parent proposes. So that is, I mean, I don't know. You're dealing with deep passions and in a, in a divorce where people have uh, resentment. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think the principle to be taken away from that is that uh, living rationally is is about not giving into that, seeing the long-term picture, which is as a parent, you have a responsibility not to the child, not to win, not to beat up your spouse uh, or, you know, or gain a victory through the kids, but to give up that resentment and, and, and have the same rules for each house so that you can both enforce them um, with, with strength and, and really provide structure. Um, because I felt like with our house, it, it, all the structure fell in, into their world and ours became something else. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like that was a, that was a, a difficult, a difficult problem to overcome. Mm-hmm. I didn't track with that. Do you mean that the other household was setting the rules and uh, they yeah. were the legislature and you were just the executive? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. We okay. weren't even the executive. They were the yeah. legislator and the executive. It's like mm-hmm. we, we, we couldn't legislate or be the executive without losing. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this, this, this sense uh, and maybe it was because of his stature, because he's a psychologist or a psychiatrist rather. And, uh, you know, we weren't, you know, that that had and, and he's their father. He had a certain, you know, um, his authority had a certain uh, mm. sense of realism to them than than our household. There is a credibility to it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, are there any, I don't know what lesson to draw out of that. I mean, it, it seems like a lesson of serenity and confidence, you know, deserved or not, that if you are living rationally and showing patience and understanding and gen, it, addressing things genuinely and earnestly, that eventually the children will see that, that it, that might not happen in the moment, but they will come around eventually. I think that's what I would have to hope through that experience because there is so little control that you can uh, actually have. Yeah, it's it's remarkable that the more hellish the situation gets, the clearer you need to be about what your goal is as a parent, you know? Um, and ultimately the goal is not a short term, like you're saying, it's not to win this dispute, it's not to... Uh, uh, have this particular thing go my way, but you want to make sure that every encounter you have with the child is um, beneficial and uh, is, even if they don't like you, you know, even if you like, I should concretize a little bit more here. Um, let's suppose you have this point of conflict where you want to enforce a rule, but you know that they can just uh, hop the border into the other house. Um, you need to, the, the challenge is to figure out how do I make sure that I, I have the child here with me right now, even if they hop the border or if they um, uh, run away and they don't accept it now? How can I make sure that I, I'm always planting benevolent seeds that can eventually grow o- over time? How can I make sure that I'm acting with good character, that I'm as loving and respectful as I can be to them? Um, and it's, it takes an enormous amount of patience to accept that you don't have control over the situation for a long time, that essentially it's it's like they become an adult too early, that they get to, to run away from you um, when that really isn't a proper thing to do. Um, but it's, it's just about, can you make sure that, um, and you talked about this a little bit last time, Mark, that little moments that you had with them that you know um, paid off in the long run. I'm trying to remember exactly what, uh, there was an anecdote you said, I think about it was your, your stepson, um, where you had a moment that, uh, seemed to come back positively later. Do you know the one I'm talking about or is, uh, am I missing something? I'm not sure. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, one question I had Mark, and this is somewhat personal, so uh, you can, you can just um, refuse to answer it too. But when I was reflecting on whether, because the step-parent role is different from the parent role and the relationship with the child is different and the relationship of this, the parent and their ex um, is something separate from you to a certain extent. Did you ever find yourself 
needing to be more focused on your wife's relationship to the children, almost to like default to, or, or just be in a support role for her relationship with the children or the ex. Um, well, I felt that's what I uh, ex- almost did. I did that a lot, mm-hmm. but I, I don't know that that was good. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, uh, I felt particularly powerless in this uh, scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I had, and I saw the other step parent, I think inappropriately muscling in on mom territory. Mm-hmm. And I was really just dis- sort of disgusted by that. And, um, and I didn't want to do the same thing to uh, on the father's side. I didn't want to put them in that position of feeling torn for liking me or liking their dad more than me. I didn't want to make them feel that way. So I just tried to be present. And, mm-hmm. uh, and but I, I, I found the situation was one in which I couldn't assert too much, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and I, maybe I asserted too little. I, I don't, I don't know. Mm. Well, yeah, that seems like the, the, I'm sure there are books written about this. I haven't read them. It seems like the real challenge, as we talked about briefly last time, is defining what the step parent role really is, because it's not parent, even though that's in the title, um, but neither can it be just some sort of, you know, extra on the set, like side character. It does need to, the, the um, person in that position does need to have some kind of authority, but it's not the same kind of authority and some kind of bond, but it's not the same kind of bond. So those seem to be the real, um, very difficult challenges of figuring out how to navigate those differences. I mean, yeah, I think it's sort of like what you guys said before, you planting, you try to plant positive seeds. Like the, the best thing you could do is be an enlightened witness in a way to the, to the person's life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but sometimes, you know, like I tried to do that in a particularly crazy time for mm-hmm. one of the kids. Um, but it wound up, wound up being sort of a mistake, uh, even though I thought the kid was, um, like so depressed as to be suicidal practically. And, and I, so I thought it was time to, uh, to air things out a little bit and talk about, uh, the other parent in a way that I'd never done in 10 years, in the 10 or so years that I'd, I'd, I'd been around. Um, mm-hmm. I'd never... I'd never subjected the kids to my opinion about this, the step parent, but I did notice that, you know, they came to Tracy to talk a lot of, of smack about, um, so to my wife, I shouldn't have said her name, but everybody knows her name. Um, <laughs> uh, so they, they came, they would come to talk a lot of smack about the other step parent, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, if they're doing that to us, they're probably doing it in reverse. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that this is a particularly healthy situation. And, I don't know how to deal with this mm-hmm. because on the one hand, you want to be supportive of them, of them but on the other hand, uh, y- you also want to connect the authority between you and the other household, but you can't because they're not allowing it. And the, mm-hmm. and the worst part of your nature is like, tell me the bad. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay to keep talking crap about that person because they suck. You know, you mm-hmm. start getting into that mode. Yeah. It's, it's a real temptation. I imagine for a step parent because you're in the situation where whatever you say might get back to the other side and could cause acrimony. But the thing that's least likely to go, that they're least likely to repeat in the other home is the trash that they were talking in your home. So yeah. then that becomes the only thing that you can talk about is trash about the other family because you, you at least have some confidence in uh, that it won't have detrimental effects on the other side. But this really brings around... Um, me to another question, which is what, what were the positive things you've talked about how you can't establish the home and the rules in the way that you would like, because of this shared custody thing and this particularly toxic form of shared custody. But to what extent was there a space to uh, develop shared values and interests with the kids? Were you able to, you know, uh, I, I can you remind me how old were they again when when you became their stepfather? I've known I'd known them all their lives, but right. I became I became stepdad in two thousand and eight. So, uh, oh lord, I mean the younger one was 
probably 12, mm-hmm. the older, you know, was 16 or 17, somewhere in there. It's a tough time. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's can a hard say, time. Like, can I say really. one thing on the previous topic before we move to this question? Yeah. It just, it's funny because a, a variety of this much less um, painful or difficult came up at school recently. And the connection in my mind is that we talk a lot about using, when you're talking to your child, using I statements instead of you set statements. So kind of describing how you see something rather than being accusatory or, you know, deriding the child in some, in some way. And I Often, something that will often come up at school is there will be parents who are overly focused on grades. And we at Van Dam Academy don't give grades out for effort or for checklists, you know, box checking of completion of tasks, but for actual quality of the work. So in some cases, it's simply not possible for a child to achieve the grade they've been told to, to achieve at, at home. And Um, I find myself when I'm in that position, wanting to reassure the child that it's okay that their grades are not A's um, and and explain why that's okay. But I'm also conscious that that is a message that's in contradiction with the one they're getting at home. And it's not really my place or I don't have the authority to directly contradict what their parents are telling them the expectations are. So what I try to do in that situation is just explain um, my perspective on how they're doing, how grades work, and my own feeling as their teacher about what um, what it's appropriate for them to expect of themselves, and never address the issue of the parents at all directly. So it's it's sort of a um, it's not I'm not trying to be dishonest. I'm, it's not dishonesty to not address the parents directly. It's some kind of diplomacy and appropriateness, but I can't sh- I can't give the parents the total authority over how grades ought to be interpreted. I need them to understand what it is from my perspective, but I sort of just have to put that to them and then let it sit. And I hope ultimately that'll be those seeds that take root and make them feel confident in themselves in the long run, whatever messaging is coming from home. Yeah. So the ideal is that both parties, the parents and the teachers are on the same page, but when there is disharmony between the two of them, um, there's a few wrong ways you could handle that. One, you could just shut up and um, be complicit in what you think are the wrong standards from the other party. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other is that you could be openly hostile to the other party um and then the middle ground which is hard to walk is just to honestly and clearly articulate your thoughts um in a way that is not critical or attacking of of the other party and then you just kind of cross your fingers also in a position where the child takes the particular things that you're saying and often generalizes them especially if they're in the opposite camp from their parents generalizes those things as an attack against the parent Definitely not. I mean, it could be completely unrelated. Yeah. Like, yeah. like for example, I have, you know, I'm I'm very vocal politically. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm I'm not shy about expressing my opinion on social media and and around anybody who cares to listen. And um, my my stepson's father was a Marxist, and so he felt when I was talking, you know. Sometimes, uh, I I don't know if I ever talked directly against Marxism, but whenever, Mm. if ever I would say anything and it hinted in that direction, he thought it was an attack against his father. Mm. And I sat Mm. him down and I said, I want you to know, I respect your father's mind. I respect him as a person. (laughs) I'm talking about political ideas uh, Mm. that he and I uh, have a different perspective about, and that's perfectly legitimate to have a different perspective about it. Um, And, uh, but it's, I'm never talking about him personally. I'm talking about I- ideas. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ran up against something similar later on when my stepdaughter started going to college and being educated a particular way, um, mm-hmm. which I think was in perfect, I don't know, in, in perfect, uh, perfectly with the ideology of the other side, but not out of it. And mm-hmm. I recommended, I said, hey, if you want to, if you want to see another perspective to this, here's a couple of authors and here's a, a, a taped class from this professor that deals directly with the history of this particular phenomenon. And 
And uh, she wrote me back a one sentence blow off, basically. Mm. Um, and it wasn't me trying to say, look, man, that that sucks. That perspective is awful. That's going to make you miserable. It's mm. going it, to it's it's just terrible. Uh, these guys are so much better. And I was like, if you want, if you want to open up and, and not even open up, if you want to hear another side, mm -hmm. here's four people that could give you another side and then judge for yourself, which is right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was still seen, I think as hostile and, um, lecturing and, um, probably anti father. Yeah. And that's a conundrum that parents can face, even if there's not divorce in the home. And if there's not this, this uh, difficult relationship, you know, um, that that's something that I, I won't throw any members of my family under the bus, but there's one member of the family that went to college and has X and Y ideas and another member of the family that really doesn't like to hear that stuff. And it, there's this dynamic where they're throwing barbs and kind uh, of, uh, and it's, that is a really difficult thing to navigate. Um, one thing that I found most helpful for me, and I'm curious what you, th what you think about this, Lisa, is that um, to ask as many questions about what they're learning in like a kind of honest thing, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, it's very easy. I'm not saying that you're doing this, Mark. I'm kind of just giving like a broad uh, uh it's very easy to say, oh yeah, uh, you're, you're reading Chomsky. I know exactly what that book is. I know what he's thinking. I know what you're thinking. Here's what, here's the antidote to it. Um, but it's, it's presumptuous to think, you know, exactly what they're reading and what they're thinking about and what it means to them. And so you can get a lot more um, just to, it's also a good thing to model them how to have an honest conversation where you're inviting them to share more and more in a, a way that is safe and they won't feel criticized. Um, you know, later on, uh, I attempted something like that with my, with my stepson via email. I said, hey, I'd like to get to know you and yeah. let's, let's just talk. Cause I, I think we, we, we've, we maybe talked at each other, but we don't really know each other. And, mm. you know, you think you, you have some ideas about me. I have ideas about you. Let's see if those things are real. And, you know, three or four, uh, um, three or four emails into it, it got hostile. Um, and it was, it was more me trying so questioning, uh, trying to be, you know, Socratic in a sense, like, well, wh why do you think that? And here's my, here's my impression. And why do you think that that's not right? Or, mm. you know, in the same way that I thought was benevolent, that eventually beca it became like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Yeah. You know, well, and I think it, to the extent that anyone feels sort of insecure in their position, any sort of question about it, it may provoke hostility and defensiveness. So I imagine that was going on. And the other thing is when you describe this, this just seems like a, a real challenge of step parenting and a serious cultural problem. I mean, people, Obviously, this is much broader than these couple of kids were talking about, just the kind of recalcitrance of you you have some idea of what moral virtue is that you've absorbed from the culture and any challenge to that, that person is a is an antagonist and a um, a bad a bad guy. Um, and it's almost as it, he has a master's degree and my stepdaughter is going for a master's degree at Columbia, which, you mm -hmm. know, so. I, it's like the more they know, the more they're steeped in that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, the, the more unquestioning they are of it. Yeah. And, uh, and that their, their problem with me lies mostly in my vocal mm. st strident, you know, mm -hmm. way of presenting an idea. And mm -hmm. it carried over even to me trying to just benevolently question. I still feel mm -hmm. like, yeah. Oh, you're a prosecuting attorney. You have a you have a you have a you have a book on your shelf that says how to win every argument, and you're you're, using, you're trying to just you know you're trying to win. And I think they felt yeah. that because maybe like you said, there was a, an insecurity in the argument that was yeah. there was a little air coming in there, and rather than allow the air in and that space and self reflection and maybe change to happen, something else mm -hmm. occurred. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I I just want to share a personal anecdote where I've been on the child side of this. And I don't know, it's, it's a little funny to me, but I was at Christmas and I've got an uncle who is uh, an, 
he, uh, an environmentalist and I don't know if he's a full-fledged Marxist, but he did give me like people's history of the United States for Christmas one year. Um, and I was playing a, a, a card game and he comes over and he's asking me questions. Seems like he's being very polite, trying to get to know it. And he goes, oh, so the purpose is to maximize your resource explo exploitation. Is that right? And like just, in, I was 10 years old and instantly you can just smell it that, okay, that he's, he's angling for something. There's some, there's some agenda in this conversation. I'm like, I don't think I want to play anymore. And I shuffled up the cards and got a snack at the table. And if there's just, uh, it's hard. It's, it's so hard because it's so easy for someone to, uh, uh, to smell that even if it's not there maybe my my uncle really was trying to mm -hmm. uh be very friendly with me and the words just came out that way but it can be it it can be really people can get really touchy or sensitive about that sort well, of thing. He, he probably was trying to be friendly that's just him that's the way yeah he thinks. and that's, that's his vocabulary out. yeah yeah, yeah. I love um, that. I, I'm not trying to uh, say anything bad. By the way, I was given the people's history as well by my stepson for for Christmas. Oh. <laughs> That's so. great. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I know we have to wrap up, but I want to that that made a story occur to me that allows us to end on a, a sort of moment of hope. A little bit embarrassment for me, but um, when I was when I graduated from high school, I got a job working for NYPIRG, the New York Public Interest Research Group, something started by Ralph Nader, and I went door to door lobbying for this uh, as an environmental lobbyist. And I remember going up to one house and talking about food irradiation, and I'm pretty sure what I described to the person was that irradiated food is you take your produce and you expose it to nuclear waste. I had no idea what I was doing. It was just such empty, absolutely wrong jargon. Yeah. And um, I think the person that I went to that day was a physicist. And he just looked at me and laughed and said, you have no clue what you're talking about. This is absurd. And he was he was aggressive and he was dismissive and he was condescending. So of course, in the moment as a recent high school graduate, my reaction was hostility and anger and he's a big jerk and he just doesn't want to accept the truth and everything. But how do I look at that now? <laughs> I want to go back and meet him. I want to yeah. find him. And um, so uh, I don't know, sometimes we'll have those defenses and those experiences, but they'll linger in our in our subconscious and eventually come around. So I hope that will be true with the Steph kids too. I hope so too. I don't know, but I hope. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we're gonna move over to Clubhouse now. Mark, you're welcome to join us. Um, Thank you. And, I'm, gonna, and, I'm, gonna tend, I'm gonna tend my dog, so okay. I might Good go there, I might not. No problem. Thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And we'll see you in Clubhouse. Oh, okay. Right. Bye, Bye guys.